Hi everyone, my name is Pippa Jones. I work with Northwest Local Land Services in the Natural Resource Management team. I'm in Gundawindi uh, and today I've got a few special guests with me. One is out of screen, you can't see her, but Dr. Kate Paul is with me and we've got Anna Makora, both from the CSIRO. Um, thanks for joining us today. This webinar is recorded, so don't forget you can watch it again later if you miss miss anything, um, you'll get an email tomorrow with the recording. Um, on the chat box um, with GoToWebinar, you can use the chat box if you have any questions. So um, just to get used to using the chat box, feel free to type in where you're calling in from today. Um, that'll give us an idea of where, where the spread of people watching are. Um, before I go into sort of further detail on what we're doing, I'd like to acknowledge the country of all the nations from which we meet today. So I'm in Gundawindi, so I'm on Bigambal and Gamilaroi country. Um, and I pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, so this is a, a four year project that local land services has developed with the CSIRO. We've been lucky to get some funding through the National Land Care Program. And so this project is supported um, by local land services with funding from the Australian Government's Land Care Program. Um, basically, uh, Kate and Anna will go into a lot more detail about what, what they do and why they do it and the things that they can find out in Brigolo Vegetation. Um, my, my larger project is around um, managing Brigolo woodland. Brigolo is an endangered ecological community and uh, so over the years through um, clearing and overgrazing, it's been degraded and it, and it doesn't have as much wiggle oil around as there used to be. So this project looks at improving condition and connectivity of wiggle oil. Um, one of the threats to wiggle oil is overgrazing. Another threat to wiggle oil is weeds and um, weed infestations. And so a lot of what Anna and Kate do is looking at healthy brigolo sites and weed infested brigolo sites and looking at the various insects that are found in those areas. So I've been out on site with them a few times doing malaise traps and um, looking at all the various insects. Uh, it's really interesting and I'm um, excited to see what else we can find out along the way. So Kate and Anna both um, are based in Brisbane with the CSIRO. Kate is an entomologist. She's got extensive history and knowledge around all things insects, both in cropped landscapes and in non cropped so in uh, native vegetation. And she, um, I guess, coordinates and leads projects that look at the role that insects play and insect behaviour in, um, in those landscapes and the ecosystem services they provide. Uh, Anna is a technician with the CSIRO. So she is uh, amazing with insect identification. We've been out in the field and she'll see something that's a millimetre long and she'll know exactly what it is. Um, and so Anna is involved with a lot of the glass house and field experiments and um, we're really lucky to be able to work with them. So I'm just gonna hand over to Anna and, and Kate and they can probably give you a bit more information about the project. Good morning, everybody. Um, first of all, thank you for taking time out of your busy days to come and join us and learn a little bit about beneficials with benefits, predators, parasitoids and pollinators. Um, I'm sure that you're all in attendance because you saw the image of this magnificent rejuvid that's on the first slide. And um, if you have a look up near its eyes and its antennas, it has this wonderful curved uh, rostrum that it goes and sticks into um, various different um, insects, um, um, some pests, and um, and gives and delivers them a really um, venomous. Uh, uh, it delivers venom and and then takes them out. So it truly is a magnificent predator. I guess before I start today, I might say that what I the work that I will present today is really a culmination of many different research projects, not only this one, but uh, it has a great foundation of science that has been supported by a number of industries, 
um, and federal and state um, funding bodies over the last 15 or 20 years. And I actually, um, go to the next slide, um, really will tell you a little bit about the research, some of the key messages, and that's really our role in this project is really to try and from our past learnings and our past science, how can we deliver some key messages that will encourage um, growers, landholders, especially those um, in, in these endangered ecosystems, reload ecosystems, to really um, look at the benefits and um, take steps um, and encourage them to actually uh, preserve and enhance these areas. And then right at the very end, I'm very excited. COVID has made us rethink the way we deliver some of these messages. And I think sometimes we just uh, talk about insects, but we seldom get to see them in action. So we are hoping to, um, to finish the, the day um, with some, um, yeah, to show you exactly what's happening in your crops and in your native vegetation. So let's get going. Um, I lead a team um, in uh, Brisbane, the Pest Suppressive Landscapes team. And that's exactly what we do. We try to understand the behavior of um, insects, um, and I should say my speciality is not pollinators, but more so the predators and especially parasitoids. We work in broad acre crops uh, and horticulture, um, natural resource management, native vegetation. We're really looking at those ecosystem services that are provided by insects. I know a lot of you will know of the other ecosystem services like um, uh, native vegetation to stop erosion or for carbon sequestration, but we're really looking at what is that, that native vegetation providing to encourage um, beneficial insects on farm? So Pip has already explained, we have, um, I, I look at insect behavior, biology and ecology, uh, Anna Makura is in the team um, behind me and she looks at taxonomy. Um, we've got a geographical uh, information specialist, Andrew Holton, who um, is sensational at knitting together all of our data, whether it be at a landscape a level or just when we are out collecting in the field. We also have Hazel Perry, who's done some great work uh, in spatial simulation and population modeling. So she actually takes the uh, work that we do in the lab and at a landscape level, and then she says, well, what if we change this? What if we put more native vegetation in? Um, and ha what happens if we rearrange la land use? Is there, are there, do they have benefits for our um, uh, insect populations, pest and beneficial? So the next slide I'm going to move to So what I really want to do is, you know, sometime, as I said, we, we, men we mentioned beneficial insects, and here I want to introduce you to this kind of scale that we look at and that we might want to consider today. So on your right hand side, you see uh, Aerobomoceros hayati. Now this is a tiny little egg parasitoid and I've just put that up there, 1.5, that scale bar to give you some idea of the scale. And this is an egg parasitoid of the of whitefly. Now this was successfully introduced by CSIRO in 2004 and is now um, commercially available for growers to use. But once again, this is really just an example of the sort of scale that we are looking at when we're looking at beneficial insects. So this tiny little parasitic wasp. But later on in the talk, I'll talk a little bit more about parasitism. Okay, so as I've just mentioned, we do work in laboratory and glasshouse experiments. We also do field work. You can see, and once again, if we go back to the field, um, we can see that this, this kind of scale. Now, I want you to imagine, we're looking at a pigeon pea crop. Now, if that pigeon pea crop wasn't there and you know, where would insects come from or where would they colonise from when, when our paddocks or our landscape is fallow? So once again, just trying to get people to think about, we are really wanting to take advantage of beneficial insects. We really need to give them a place where they can hunker down and then what we call recolonise or come out when we're planting those crops and move back into the crops after they have been fallow. 
if we go to the next slide, and once again, this is just taking just a, a really um, a conceptual example of the sort of um, data, how we would expand that on a landscape scale to understand how proportion, configuration, and composition of different land use do influence pest and beneficial insects. So, as I mentioned, the key findings and messages that I'm presenting today have really come from a great body of science and work um, done not only by our team um, over the last 15 or 20 years, but also other teams. So one of those key messages is the timing of beneficial colonisation. So I just introduced that concept. Where are our beneficial insects coming from if we, after a period of fallow? The timing is incredibly crucial, and that is our science shows if we can get those beneficial insects in at the starting of the crop um, season, we'll have a lot better control. And you can see that over time, that pest density, when we get those, and ladybird here is just to represent a, a range of beneficial insects, we can see that that pest density is kept low over time. If those beneficial insects don't arrive in our crop, if we can't get them into our crop until later on, we then have a um, much greater um, pest population. So once again, this whole idea about where are, they, where are the insects, um, where are the beneficiaries when there are no crops, and if we can get that native veg or the refuge um, a bit closer, we can get those beneficials in a lot quicker. And this is just a schematic just to give you, to, to reinforce that. Another key message um, that we've found, so we, we often are asked prescriptive, what should we plant? Um, what should we do for various different pests? Well, I guess we have to be really careful. The understanding of this science is, still has a long way to go, but a really good and general message that our science shows us is that when we have diverse native vegetation, we have a lot less pests, but when we have weedy vegetation, we get a lot more pest insects, so sorry, and the native and the, the beneficials you will find in the native veg um, and also the weedy. But we all when you have weedy um, landscapes, you'll get a lot more pests. And so that's we can just go to the next. So and once again, oh, oh. speeding past. Um, trigger happy year, sorry, getting the windy. Um, pest insects and crops are more often found on weeds. They're rarely found on native plants and beneficial insects are found on both native and vegetation crops. So that's a really a general message that we can feel really confident about delivering. So what are the benefits of native vegetation for beneficial insects? Well, they're really no different to a, a range of um, biodiversity, whether it be birds, or um, you know, mammals, marsupials. Um, native vegetation provides a, a refuge, um, a shelter, and primarily food. Um, and, and that food might be your predatory insects. When those fields are fallow, or you have um, or pest populations are low, the beneficial or even drought, um, as we've seen in this project, um, the beneficial insects can hang on because they're eating the native prey items, um, thrips, et cetera, in the native vegetation, and they can see out the drought and then be ready to um, move out into crops when those crops come back in. So what can we do to encourage beneficial insects on farm? And once again, uh, just looking at this um, image of Brigolo on the left-hand side, you'll see that it has a not only a tall strata, but you can see mid strata and maybe not so much the, the ground strata. But having, once again, having that diversity is really important. Um, you know, having Brigolo that, that flowers, um, just, just um, the, the tall strata that maybe flowers only when our seasons are good is maybe, and then, and doesn't have any um, uh, mid-story or uh, ground cover is probably doesn't offer our beneficials as much as if we can get a complex structure in there. And once again, on the left-hand side is just that, that flowering vegetation, which is really important and let's go through it. So what can we do? Plant a range of vegetation so there's something flowering all year round for our beneficials. Start small um, and on a great GRDC project, um, we, um, yeah, just some criteria starts more considering we try to encourage growers to think about 
places where that they were using herbicide and would they consider um, uh, perhaps trying to grow low growing native vegetation where they often um, would, uh, see weeds. So replacement was um, a key message there. And I think that often we think that native vegetation is just about tall trees and shrubs. And we have a great database and a growing database that shows us there's a huge range of native vegetation that won't, that, you know, won't grow um, more than a metre and quite often less than 60 centimetres and, and will tolerate a range of conditions, whether it's clay or salt, etc. So one of those messages was just to encourage growers to think a little bit differently about um, when they did see weeds and was there a place to um, replace that with native vegetation species. Um, and then the last point I've got on this slide here is to establish vegetation in areas that are less likely to be disturbed. Um, and beneficials um, like a, you know, a range of, of, of other animals, whether it be lizards or, or frogs or marsupials, uh, really will thrive in areas that are, are less, uh, less disturbed. And once again, those areas don't have to be large, um, but yeah, great if they can, uh, that can be happening on farm. Okay. So um, back to insects, because now we promise, because we're entomologists, to show you a little bit more about beneficials in, act in action. So let's first go to something that we, have found in Brigolo, and that is, and and as I, I have admitted, I'm not a uh, an expert on on pollinators, but I couldn't resist in showing you something we have found here, and that is the giant carpenter bee, and they really are spectacular. And here's a female, um, and I would just like to um, thank the Australia for the the image that I've pinched from them, but um, the reason I wanted to just start here with pollinators is that. You know, we often think of Apis mellifera or the common honeybee, but we have found through our studies that there's a range of insects that move through your crops. And, and we will see one right at the very end of today that we don't really consider a pollinator, but it carries pollen. And as it's going through your crop, no doubt it's depositing pollen here, there and everywhere. So I guess when we say pollinators, I'd like to get people to think of, it's not just Apis mellifera, but a whole range of insects. Um, that are, are, are visiting and moving through your crop and no doubt depositing pollen. Um, so yeah, that's, that's where I'm gonna start and start with pollinators. But let's go on to our parasitoids. And once again, I think quite often we say a parasitic wasp, but what does that really, really mean? I introduced you to Hayati here, the silver leaf white flow par parasitoid um, at 1.5 mils. But I'd like to now show you just exactly how a parasitic system works. We also have parasitic flies, but the, the things that are more common are our parasitoids. So here's the general life cycle of a cotton boll worm or helicoverpa, moth and its associated parasitoids. So we see the moth up there in the center. And of course the moth lays eggs in our crop, whether it be sorghum or cotton, et cetera. And we have egg parasitoids, tiny little egg parasitoids. We also have parasitoids of the caterpillar. And that's probably the most obvious thing that we see that's eating our crop is when the caterpillars start chomping holes through it. And of course that caterpillar, in the case of Helicoverpa, will, um, when it matures, drop to the ground and pupate, and then a moth will emerge. And so that cycle continues. If we introduce the parasitoid, What's happening there is, and in this case, it's a caterpillar parasitoid. So we have the moth, lays its eggs, caterpillar um, starts to grow, but then the parasitic wasp comes along and injects with a hypodermic needle, injects an egg inside the larvae. And it's not dissimilar to alien, that egg hatches inside of the caterpillar and actually eats the caterpillar from the inside out. Yep. You'll see that um, parasitic wasp will pupate inside the caterpillar now, instead of that um, caterpillar turning into a moth, it indeed, um, you we have a parasitic uh, wasp that emerges. So I'd just like to, you know, just in case people are unfamiliar with that whole thing, that's how that system works. And um, without further ado, I think we should go and see um, a parasitic wasp in action. Before I start this video, I just want to point out, this happens very fast. So these um, wasps can deliver many, many eggs. 
um, when they inject a caterpillar with an egg, it's a split second. So I'm going to just give you a little bit of a head start here and tell you that just keep watching, but this parasitoid is going to get its ovipositor and it's going to stab this helicobertha larvae underneath its head. It happens really quickly and perhaps at the end of the um, session today, people, yeah, watch, watch it back. I think uh, Pip is sending it out to, to, to all of those people in attendance. Okay, so let's play this video and see what happens to parasitoids and attacking helicobertha larvae. So here we go, I'm just checking out the larvae. Oh, right under the head, you see that ovipositor now stuck in underneath that helicoverpa egg. So I've just injected an egg into that poor helicoverpa. The helicoverpa larvae is gonna wander off now and uh, that wasp will go off and um, parasitize uh, another, another larvae. So the next insect in action, um, I'd like to introduce you to, and perhaps everyone's familiar with surfed or hoverflies, and we have them not only in the Brigalow native vegetation, but we also have them around our gardens, and they're quite ubiquitous. There are a number of different species, and they're really quite pretty, and they do have this kind of hovering effect. You can see they're very large eyes, um, so hovering around flowers. And I, sh I should have mentioned in a previous slide that the other reason that we like to provide provision our beneficial insects with um, flowers is because we know um, that um, beneficial insects will live quite often twice as long if they can get their hands on the carbohydrate source. So that will either be nectar, um, sometimes honeydew, which comes from aphids, um, we can talk about that another day, um, or um, pollen. But when we look at hoverflies, this is the adult. The adult's not the thing that's um, uh, uh, taking out insect pests, it's actually the larvae of this fly that is the predator. So once again, let's see this action. I'm just going to draw your attention. I hope everybody can see the blue light blue circle down in the left hand um, corner of this slide. You'll see that there's a big, or two green blobs, um, the circles around the larger of the green blobs. These green blobs are the larvae of that surfed fly. So when we start this video, and um, so this is uh, uh, aphids that are our focus pest here, um, just keep your eye on that blue circle, because once again, we'll see this larvae in action and see what it does to um, a poor little aphid. So here we go. There we go, I've got my aphid, and now I'm just going to suck the living daylights out of it, I think. Um, and uh, there it is, and it turns uh, into a tiny shrunken dead aphid. So that's how surfed larvae operate. In our final beneficial in action today, we're going to look at um, Dichronolius um, bellus and uh, the red and blue beetle. And once again, um, a, a really fantastic predator that we find not only in native vegetation, but um, when uh, yeah, crops are at their most, you'll find red and blue beetle um, everywhere um, in northern New South Wales, Brigolo, right up through Queensland, um, and a sensational little predatory beetle. So uh, let's go and watch it in action. So here we are with an aphid again. And I think the thing that we often forget too is that, um, you know, beneficial insects or some of them aren't constrained by time. So if we can increase populations of them in our native vegetation and our crops, we're really getting this benefit that's 24 seven. They are out there just motoring through and um, looking for their favorite um, uh, food and, uh, and then chowing down on it. So hopefully these three examples have shown you just exactly how that happens. That pretty much brings us to the end of my presentation today. But once again, uh, we would especially like to thank the growers. Many of you over the years have given us access to fields and on-farm resources to conduct our research, which is really important because uh, every project we learn something different and we begin to to build a jigsaw puzzle around natural resources, insect pests, predators and beneficials. I would also like to thank industry bodies. We've had great support over the years from GRDC, CRDC and Horticulture uh, for supporting our research and that makes a presentation like this possible. Um, 
I'd also like to thank a barrage of previous researchers, not only in the team at CSIRO, but beyond. And today I'd especially like to thank uh, New South Wales Local Land Services, who have been really supportive in just getting these key messages out. And once again, you know, how is it that we can encourage these things? And what really is the link between native vegetation and beneficial insects? Also, I'd like to thank Anna Makora. You've met her earlier on. Um, Anna is instrumental um, in collecting data and uh, all of our taxonomic information. Jabe Wang, I'd also like to, uh, a big shout out to Jabe. He was uh, helpful in putting together uh, the videos today, as was Anna, and Andrew Holthen, who um, is really helpful in around our, um, the integrating all of our data on the team. Thank you all. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and I'd be more than happy to take any questions. Thanks, Anna. I'm uh, sorry, Anna and Kate. Uh, I um, especially found today's webinar interesting because it actually shows you what those beneficials look like. We've talked about them for years and how important they are in, in native vegetation and cropping landscapes, such as in Brigalow tree lines. Uh, but when you actually see them and see what they do, I think that adds so much more to, to the whole project and to um, understanding and learning for, for landholders and community members. So thanks for putting that for us, guys. Um, as I said, this FIRO project is part of my larger Brigalow Woodland project uh, about maintaining and preserving what there is and improving the condition of it. So while part of that I didn't mention before is that we have been supporting landholders to manage weeds in Brigalow vegetation and to um, manage grazing and um, increasing awareness of, of um, things like your beneficial insects and the important role they play and then hence the important role that Brigalow play, plays in landscapes. So I think Kate and Anna are really um, pulling together some really interesting information that really helps us paint a picture for landholders um, in the region in the northwest of uh, New South Wales where a lot of the Brigalow um, exists. So um, thank you again to Kate and Anna, and thanks everyone for calling in. Don't forget this is recorded, so you will get an email tomorrow um, if you wanted to check back and, and see those videos again or uh, show your friends. Uh, anyway, there is a short survey at the end as well that we'd really appreciate if you took the time to answer the survey. Um, and yeah. Thanks very much for your time and um, yeah, we'll let you go. Thank you.